Hello and how are you? I hope you're having a great day. We're going to talk about Bitcoin news today. In fact, we're going to look at Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency wealth transfer. Now, I'm not talking about wealth moving around in cryptocurrencies, but rather we're talking about wealth moving from the wealthy into cryptocurrency. And so let's dig into this because this is really interesting. Be sure to watch the entire video. Don't miss a second because we have some great things planned for you. So should I buy Bitcoin now or should I wait? We're going to give you ideas to help you take profits and avoid losses. Can we get this video to 99 likes? Smash the like button. It really does help us out a lot. I'm not a financial advisor. In fact, my background is in computers and software engineering. This is not financial advice. This is my opinion. Cryptocurrency involves substantial risk of loss. And if you're investing in crypto, read the rest of this disclaimer. Take it very seriously. It's important that you keep your finances safe and that you protect your family and that you don't over overdo it. I mean, it's easy to get emotional about something you're excited about and to overinvest. Uh, now, before I get into our topic for today, I want to bring this up because this really does have, this chart has a lot to do with what's going on and why institutions are moving their money from where they currently have it into Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. So if you took $1,000 and you bought Bitcoin and held it for three years and then sold it, so let's say on January 1, 2017, you bought $1,000 worth of Bitcoin and then you sold it on December 31st, 2019, you would get $7,206. Now that is a seven-fold return on your $1,000 investment. Even for the wealthy, that is a spectacular return. Now, one of the things you want to keep in mind is the wealthy is very familiar with these numbers. And so we want to become familiar with these numbers. It's these numbers that are motivating them to get involved in cryptocurrency. They saw that they could have made $7,000 for every thousand invested or 8,000 or 43,000 or even 60,000 and, and, Hold, hold me back, $2.6 million, $2.686 million could have been made if you bought $1,000 worth of Bitcoin on January 1, 2011 and sold it on December 31st, 2013. So that is a, re is a spectacular, incredible return on an investment. So let's take a look at how much wealth there is in the entire world. Currently today, there's $360 trillion of wealth in the world. Now, the top 1%, the top, the 1% the, the, the of the wealthiest people in the world own 50% of that or $180 trillion. So this half of this pie represents $180 trillion and it's in the hands of the top 1%. Now, when you add the next 4% and you got a total of 5%, 5% of the wealthiest people in the world own 76, 50 plus 26, <coughs> excuse me, they own 76% of the wealth in the world. Now, these people, one of the things that, you know, some people like to play football, some people like to watch football. Well, with the wealthy, the game that they play is how can I get more money? How can I increase my wealth? And so the top 5% are trying to, they're all kind of competing. Think of it as a big game. To them, it's a big game. And the way they keep score is how much wealth they have. And so they're looking to increase their wealth. And so when they see an opportunity like this where in three years they could have taken $1,000 and turned it into $2.6 even the $7,000, they're, 
they don't find opportunities where they can get seven times their money in a three-year period. And when there is an opportunity like that, these people pay attention. And that's why we're seeing more and more institutions and wealthy people getting involved in cryptocurrency. So let's dig into this a little bit deeper. On a daily basis, uh, you can see that the market cap of Bitcoin is about $176 billion. And $176 billion sounds like a lot of money, but really it's not even 1% of this total figure. You're talking the total figure is $360 trillion. And so the market cap of Bitcoin is still kind of a drop in the bucket for the wealthy, but they're looking for ways how they can increase their wealth, and so that's gotten their attention. Now, on a daily basis, there's only 5% of, of, the, of the total amount of Bitcoin that's actually traded on the open cryptocurrency market. Now, days with high volume might hit 10%, might hit 20%, um, but the, the volume typically stays right around the 4 to 6% range, sometimes dropping into 3%. And so there's only a small uh, percentage of cryptocurrency that's traded on a daily basis. And so if these guys took their trillions of dollars and pushed it into cryptocurrency, it's going to force the price up. With only 5% typically circulating on a daily basis, a small percentage of this wealth moving into cryptocurrency is going to move the needle dramatically on these numbers and push the price of Bitcoin way up, push the market cap of Bitcoin way up, and push uh, the daily volume of Bitcoin way up. Now, one of the things we need to keep in mind while I'm doing a lot of talking about Bitcoin, that's because Bitcoin currently has uh, uh, somewhere around 70% of the total wealth in cryptocurrency is in Bitcoin and the other 30% or 20% of the wealth in cryptocurrency is spread out amongst a bunch of other cryptocurrency coins. So that's the why, reason why I'm talking primarily about Bitcoin. But when Bitcoin goes up, the entire cryptocurrency market goes up. When Bitcoin goes down, the entire cryptocurrency market goes down. For the most part, all the other cryptocurrencies tend to behave very similar to the way that Bitcoin is behaving. And if you're invested in a cryptocurrency that does not follow Bitcoin's price, uh, make sure that you've been very, very careful about that cryptocurrency and about your choice in investing in it. Um, because... There are, there are a ton of cryptocurrencies that no longer exist and you don't want to be buying a cryptocurrency that ends up going to zero. And so if you're investing in something outside of Bitcoin, do take a lot of caution. Anyway, enough said about that. So 5% of the wealth is traded on a daily basis in Bitcoin. And when the institutions start taking their trillions of dollars and moving it into Bitcoin and altcoin, they need vehicles in order to do that. And over the last four or five years, there have been a lot of companies building platforms for institutions to invest in cryptocurrency. Now, <coughs> there are four different ways that different institutions are, are getting involved in cryptocurrency. Endowment funds, a lot of them are getting involved directly. We're going to talk about endowment funds. We're going to talk about investment funds. We're going to look at institutional markets. And we're going to look at institutional custody. So endowment funds, over 150 different endowment funds were surveyed. And those endowment funds included Yale, Harvard, MIT, Stanford, and many others. Now, these endowment funds, 90% of them said that they either already have invested in cryptocurrency or they plan on investing in cryptocurrency. And these endowment funds have significant amounts of money. Yale, for example, has a $39 billion endowment fund. And so for them to already be getting involved, some of the price volume that we're seeing here is coming from Yale. Some of the price volume comes from Harvard, MIT, Stanford, and many other uh, universities 
and other endowment funds. So some of the endowment funds might be an endowment fund for uh, a state, uh, for other kinds of large institutions that manage money for uh, uh, wealthy families, for uh, different kinds of funds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so endowment funds includes a lot of different uh, different kinds of money. Investment funds are are funds that have been set up and are specifically investing in cryptocurrency. Three examples of that, and there are many, many others. I just picked three as Grayscale Investments, Polychain Capital, and Pantera Capital. Grayscale in particular currently owns, now catch this, this is important, they own 1.5% of all Bitcoin in existence. Imagine that, a single organization owning 1.5% of all Bitcoin. Now, you can invest with Grayscale Investments if you have a stock account, like maybe you're on Robinhood, or you're on Fidelity, or you're on Charles Schwab, or one of the other, you have an account somewhere where you're buying stocks. Uh, if you buy the ticker symbol, symbol GBTC, you're investing in the Grayscale Bitcoin, invest, uh, Bitcoin Trust, Bitcoin Fund. Now, 90% of the money that's invested in GBTC came from institutions, and the other 10% came from retail investors. And so the vast majority of that 1.5% that owns Bitcoin was purchased by institutions through the stock ticker symbol GBTC. And so that's an important thing to keep in mind. In fact, every week, every month, Grayscale has been purchasing more and more and more Bitcoin. Now, they also have other funds that are for the other, some of the altcoins, some of the other cryptocurrencies, such as Ethereum and about five or six others. They, Grayscale does not get involved in a large number of cryptocurrency. They kept it very, very small in terms of the different cryptocurrencies that you can invest in through them. And Polychain and Pantera have done similar things. Um, but the key thing here is that these are other ways that institutions are getting exposure into cryptocurrency. We also have institutional markets. An institutional market is a place where uh, institutions go to buy and sell cryptocurrency. The backed exchange opened up in September and the backed exchange is a joint venture between Starbucks, Microsoft, and the, the company that owns the New York Stock Exchange. Those three companies took 500, almost half a billion dollars. They took almost half of a billion dollars in order to make a, an exchange, and they're primarily trading futures contracts, but when the contract expires, the person holding the contract gets one Bitcoin. And so those contracts are traded on the backed exchange and you can buy and sell them. And then if you're holding that contract on its expiration date, you'll end up owning some Bitcoin. Now that Bitcoin is also held or custodied by backed in their own custody warehouses. And so one of the things that's important for institutions, some institutions legally cannot manage assets that they own. So for example, if you've got the, the pension fund for the state of Texas or the pension fund for whatever state you wanna pick, that, that pension fund has to have a third party managing the assets that they own. In other words, they have to have some kind of custody service. And so the backed exchange is one of those custody services that on purpose serves institutions because institutions require that in order for them to get involved in, in into uh, uh, that particular asset class. So if they're buying real estate, they have a company that custodies that real estate. If they're buying stocks, there's a company that will custody those stocks, etc., etc. 
Now you can see there's a number of different choices. Now none of these lists are, in, are intended to be uh, exhaustive. There's a whole lot of other funds. There's a whole lot of investment funds. There's a whole lot of other endowment funds. There's a whole lot of other institutional markets. I only put up a, a, a short list so that we had a brief number of talking points. But here's the Here's the key thing. And so institutional markets we have backed. We have the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. We have Fidelity Digital Assets. Fidelity manages $6 trillion worth of assets. We have over-the-counter exchanges. Uh, you have, as far as custody services, you have backed Coinbase, Binance, and many, many others. But here's the point. Institutions are moving money into Bitcoin and altcoins. They're taking it from wherever they currently have it and transferring it into Bitcoin. And that is a form of wealth transfer. And if you're on the side of you already own Bitcoin and Bitcoin's price is going up because institutions are moving trillions of dollars gradually and slowly into Bitcoin, then you're going to benefit from the price increase and will you see a $7,000 uh, gain over a three-year period? Could be, but I think there's even more potential than $7,000 because we need to keep in, in mind the penetration of the target market. Now, the penetration of the target market for cryptocurrency, we're way down in this area. We're still in the very, very early, early adopters. When you look at the number of individuals that actually own cryptocurrency, we're less than half of a percent. I mean, it's just a tiny, tiny fraction of a percent of the world's population are actually invested in cryptocurrency. And with the things that are being built for both retail and institutions, we're going to see a large I mean, when you think about this $360 trillion total global wealth uh, and Bitcoin having only a $176 billion market cap, we're really on the tip of the iceberg. We're way back here in terms of early adopters. We haven't seen the mass portion, the greatest portion of this growth curve that's yet to happen sometime in the future. I tend to think it'll happen sooner rather than later. But when you look at you know, uh, companies like Microsoft, Starbucks, and the New York Stock Exchange investing half a billion dollars just so that they can build an institutional exchange so that institutions can have exposure into cryptocurrency, now, BACT is not stopping there. BACT also has its eyes on the retail market. And sometime this summer, BACT has, BACT has plans to announce a app for your uh, smartphone that allows you to not only manage cryptocurrency to buy and sell Bitcoin, but you can also do that with your airline rewards points. And um, if you're involved in any kind of game and the game has some kind of rewards points or a whole bunch of other different electronic digital points or currencies, you'll be able to transfer those and use them. So once you have this backed app, you'll be able to go down to Starbucks and buy coffee with your cryptocurrency or with your airline miles or with a whole lot of other points that'll be available through the backed app. And so things are getting very, very interesting. Now, this is my opinion. This is not financial advice, but I wanted to share this information with you because knowledge is power and knowledge can make a huge difference for you and your financial future. Our, our goal here at Luminate is to help you take profits and avoid losses. And so I hope that this video is giving you some ideas in that regards. But if you have any questions, how can I be of service to you? Please ask your questions in the comment section and we will do our best to give you good quality information, good quality answers to your questions. In the meantime, I hope that you'll like, subscribe, and hodl. And hey, do me a favor and have a fantastic day.